I don't know. Let's start the show, I guess. Max keyframe interval. That's the, the word of the night. If anybody says max keyframe interval, take a drink because uh, apparently that's shut down my chat for some reason. Unfucking real. Learn what you can do to improve the quality. <laughs> oh, everyone's, I'm getting the, everyone's telling me it's fine. So Twitch apparently is the only one having a problem with my max keyframe interval. For those of you that, um, you know, have a little problem logging into, uh, the old life at the bike website, uh, you know, I'm here for you. Post in the forums what your problem is and we'll fix it. <laughs> what else can I say? I mean, I want it all to work perfect. Everyone here wants it to work perfect. Me, most of anybody, because I don't even know what the fuck is wrong. Whenever I log in, it works. So thanks everybody for joining the people at YouTube, the people of Vimeo, people live at the bike, people at Twitch. Thank you everybody for joining. Huge show tonight. DGAF. Live poker legend. Uh. On the show. Smoking this Fuente uh, Grand Reserva. It's a, it's a Florfina 858. It was uh, given to me by a guy named uh, Carlos from Miami. Very nice guy. And I'm drinking this... Um, this uh, Belgian beer, also given to me by a listener, Snevens in the forums. Thanks for the Belgian beer. He's actually from Belgium. Traveled all the way here to bring me this beer. And the guy from Miami didn't quite travel. I, I got this at the fight. Um, I wasn't actually at the fight. Too expensive. Oh, fucking. I'm just, and I was thinking about buying tickets to that, too. But watching it, it was just a bit of a... I mean... If, I'm not going to be like your classic person who says it was a snooze fest because I like the inner workings of boxing. I, you know, I like, uh, I like a defensive fight, you know, as much as anybody. But, uh, was there an injury? I hear people saying that Pacquiao could be faking an injury. At this point, I don't really think he can fake the injury because, uh, uh, because he, he, there's a there's a class action lawsuit against him. So with this class action lawsuit now, he has to go through with some sort of surgery. Because if he doesn't go through with this surgery, all fucking hell is going to break loose. He's going to uh, owe like $5 million to um, these people who say they got ripped off on their uh, fucking pay-per-view. Uh, if you're in the chat... Trying to chat with me. I cannot chat with you. I got blocked out of the chat because my max keyframe interval is currently at 8.432 seconds. I have no fucking clue what that means, but I'm locked out of chat. If you're in the live at the bike chat, uh, fucking A, it's just too annoying. I, I, It's just too much for me to deal with. Oh, <laughs> did you tune in to watch a grown man cry? Oh, <laughs> So anyway, I've got this great cigar given to me by my man Carlos. I've got this great fucking beer given to me by my man Snevins. Brought it all the way from Belgium. And we're going to have a great show no matter what. Because DGAF is on the show. I think that stands for Don't Give a Fuck. I'll ask him. I'm not sure. It's a very fruity beer. This is a very light cigar. I mean... I'm not going to be able to talk to you on chat. So if you want to talk to me tonight, you have to call in. Even if you're, you know... Uh, like one of those people who doesn't like to talk to people. Introvert, I guess they're called. Uh, five five nine eight two three five four eight three is the call in number. I'll put you on with uh, me and DGAF at the time, at the proper time. Oh, that night in Vegas was crazy, fucking crazy during the fight. I was at Aria in a Pot Limit Omaha game. The, pot, the, the game was 
do two five ten with a twenty straddle. So it's two five ten twenty pot limit Omaha. I didn't plan on playing poker in Vegas. I mean, I I just planned on counting cards, doing a little little of this and a little of that. Uh, unknown number, you were on uh, poker sesh with uh, Lyman Poker. Who's this? Hi, it's um it's Luca Mac from Australia. What's happening? Hey, Luke Mack, I think, uh, let me turn up, I, 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 I don't know how loud you are here, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hold, hold up, fucking, you're calling from Australia, but this, I don't got a fucking plus symbol here, hold on one second. <laughs> hey, is this, uh, Billy? What's up, man? Or oh, DGAF, I'm fucking, I already fucked it up. Good job. <laughs> I gotta turn up the That's volume okay. here, there's something wrong with your, uh, I have your I have you on speaker. If it sucks, just let me know and I'll take it off. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but do you want me to go off speaker? Just let me know. I could care less. You know, it's all the same to me. As long as uh, you can hear me fine, then uh, it's all good. I want to say I'm sorry to Luca Mac, who just called in. Uh, When I answered DGAF, (laughs) I hung up on you. So, what do you want me to do? I mean... Oh, fucking this microphone is like too loud. I'm having like a million problems today, DG. I'm very sorry. You're in Las Vegas, huh? Yeah, I just got in today. I was just talking about Las Vegas. I got to take this fucking headphone thing off one ear or something. I'm getting a fucking echo. Um, Here, I'll just take it off speaker. No, no, it's not you. You're 100% fine. This is, this is, uh, this is something completely different. Um, yeah, I was in there. I was in Las Vegas for the fight weekend, and I was just saying that the games were unreal good. And I mean, I don't normally play poker in Las Vegas. Were you there for right. the fight weekend? Uh, no, but my friend said they were amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I was just about to tell a story. You'll like this. I go into the Aria, and there's basically a five, ten, twenty pot limit Omaha going, and there's. It, the game had just started. Two NFL guys, their entourages, and then I'm just like, oh, there's a seat open, so I sit. And the uh, one of the NFL guys proceeds to tell me, oh, I don't, I'm not sure you want to sit in this game, man, because there's some special rules in this game. And I'm like, well, what's the special rule? And he's like, well, you can't fold preflop. Nobody can fold pre-flop? If it's, like, raised, you can fold. But you can't... Not, you have to at least limp, right? Oh, that, that's fair. Yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, I'm like, I have no problem with this whatsoever. So, <laughs> that was that's the... Pretty sweet. And these guys, I mean, when they were saying, like, you couldn't fold pre-flop, basically what they meant for each other was you couldn't fold ever. <laughs> right. So it was. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're in the NFL, you might as well just never fold. Yeah. So it ended up being basically one of the best PLO games I ever played in. And it didn't last very long because it was like right before the fight started. And so then uh, they all bailed after about. An, they bailed after a couple hours, but I mean, it was. And then, I mean, I, I'm not. I don't want to be a stereotype guy, but. <laughs> I think you could, uh, it was, uh, it was a very special city for a few days. Very, very special. Yeah. Did you, uh, go in the pit after that or what? In the pit? Yeah. Yeah, I went and, uh. Was that the best time to be in the pit or no? Oh, it was very good. I did some card counting. Nobody's paying any attention to you whatsoever. I mean, right. I'm sitting at a table that has like a hundred minimum, but basically the minimum that anyone betting was, uh, 2,000. So I'm spreading my bets from like 100 to 2,000 and no, no one on the planet notices. It's, no, they're just swamped, right? Yeah, you're just, you're just lost. You're lost in the mix. So a lot of people tuned in tonight to uh, hear the infamous, famous, legendary DGAF. Is this the first time you've ever done any like poker media, poker interview or anything like this? Yeah, 100%. First time. <laughs> Prize first time, only time. All right. <laughs> I feel special. But, yeah, you are special. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. 
No, I, I don't know. I uh, no, I've never even like listened to a podcast before. So, how many people are listening to this? Uh, well, right now, uh, Twitch, it's like forty or fifty, and then it'll be another hundred over at Live at the Bike, and then like maybe a thousand will listen um, on the recorded one. So, okay. you know, whatever. We'll see how big the number gets tonight. Maybe we'll get it up to a, a few hundred live. I got people calling in to talk to you right now. Do you want to take a call right out the gate? Yeah, let's, sure. Whatever you want to do, man. Okay, let's do it. Uh, 613, you're on with DGAF and Lyman. What's up, brother? Hey, Lyman. How's it going? It's Toast DGF. Hey, Toast. What's up, brother? Uh, you got a question much, for You got a question for DGAF or you just want to shoot the shit? What's up? Uh, well, I got uh, I, to- I uh, posted to the forums. I was going to ask the most important poker question of all time. Okay. And it actually works out perfectly because uh, he's probably a good guy to answer it as well. Right. But, um, I just wanted to sh- quickly say before, though, uh, DJF, I-, I used to spend a good amount of time on 2 plus 2 and uh, kind of read your posts. And uh, for, like, two years, I thought you were the black guy in your avatar pick <laughs> before... <laughs> Before I realized that that's Teddy Iceman Monroe. <laughs> yeah, that's my hero. <laughs> Teddy's great. Yeah, yeah. I like. I totally thought that was you for the longest time, and so now, like, I just can't shake that image. So that's just what you look like. <laughs> he looks basically he looks like that, similar, except so. instead of having like uh, headphones with a bunch of fucking diamonds and and gold and shit, he has got like a big fucking necklace on the outside of his t-shirt, just <laughs> blinging oh, yeah. out of control. Beautiful. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm not. <laughs> all right, all right, Tots. Tots, what's up, Tots? Right, right. So, uh, so the question kind of comes from something uh, we kind of started talking about back in the Crush Live Poker forums, and uh, I think you were going to uh, answer it on the podcast, but kind of didn't get to it. But basically, we're talking about the sort of longevity of poker as a source of income as a profession right and uh we were talking about some of the technological things that might be happening in the near future sort of google glass variety shit right uh that might you know might impact the games might impact the ability of people to make money off the game right um and also i guess i kind of want to rope into that like legislation i mean like obviously black friday happened kind of caught a bunch of people with their pants down and I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to be caught with their pants down unless I like literally, my pants down, li- so. literally after Black Friday, a bunch of people could not play poker with their pants down anymore. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, so it's like I mean it's a little different for for live poker, obviously, but um, it's kind of fucked up, right? Because it's not it's not actually a real profession in a certain sense. So it can just sort of go away. I think uh, it's a little more volatile, you know. Okay. So I guess I just wanted to have you guys' take on what you think the risks are, what you think the outlook is in terms of how long yeah. this gig is going to last, you know? All right. Thanks, Tots. Yeah. you have any thoughts on that, uh, DG? I mean, I'm going to let you talk about the online thing. I know nothing about, uh, you know, like anything that's going on with the online. I think live poker is always going to be fine. Uh, I mean fine as in profitable. It's not like a good decision to play it for a living in my opinion, <laughs> but it, I don't think it's ever going to be like too difficult to make a living if you're good and you know how to get action. Right. Um, you're like, I don't know, there's certain things you have to do, like, you know, your schedule has to get pretty jacked and, uh, you know, you have to be pretty tough, but live is always going to be, I think it's always going to be like, pretty profitable if you can just like deal with the swings and like the terrible environment and all that right I, I I tend to agree with you I mean a lot of people who think that live poker is gonna die are basically just saying me showing up at the casino anytime I want and having full games with rec players is gonna die that part that part might get a little hairy from time to time, 
the the idea that you just show up and uh, there's a game waiting for you a hundred percent of the time that you can win in and it's always no limit hold'em and it's right. all, and, and, and there's a two five a five five a five ten a ten twenty a twenty forty the the sort of the the idea that uh, you, you know you have this in, the, the entitled idea that you're entitled to have a game that fits your role and that you can easily beat and that you can just seat change whenever you want and you can table change whenever you want and that uh, you're just going to be happily invited back that part of poker might be over but yeah I agree with that like there are a lot of people who just do what you say they just show up and expect like you know to have everything handed to them in that sense but it's like the people that have been doing it for a while, they know how to get action and like turn that shitty game into a good game, right. make it bigger, get people to play shorthanded, all the stuff where you're going to actually like earn your money. Right. Absolutely. So you're like, yeah. you're like, you play, we play vastly different hours because you're the night owl and I'm like the day guy. Well, Be- I'm old. suck at full ring. Right. I just can't, I can't pull before the flop, so I, I don't suck at pulling, like, I could play good if it was big enough, but I just don't play good pulling, so I know myself, so I just try and play overnight when it's shorthanded. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm pretty good at shorthanded. Now, something I said once, a long time ago, and I mean, there, I'm sure there's some truth to it, and there's some, not so much truth to it, but if you're basically a full ring style player uh, who is like maybe, you know, the, a small winning type, the type that knows to, to basically play really tight pre-flop and watch TV and basically right. play a lot looser post-flop and try and get to showdown, right? Right. A lot of these guys can, you know, basically squeak out a little bit of money while eating yeah, free food. It used to be elite free food. Now I think you have to pay for it to a certain extent. Um, but when the games got short, the guy who sort of like was the laggy sort of losing player actually becomes like a beast in the short games. And I used to think that this is what I'm getting to is I used to think that short games almost self-selected for the type of not that you're no, I'm not talking about you when I talk about a losing rec player, but they sort of self-selected at times for the type of loose uh, losing rec player that would be better at a shorthanded game. Is this something you've noticed or no? Um, I'm not sure what, what you mean by self-select, but I, I, I mean it's it's just pretty clear. Like the one like thing that people are, that are a little bit less skilled. Um, the one thing they can use in a full range game is patience right. and like hand selection, and yes. they're gonna like, they're gonna like, it's even if you're a lot better than them, they're they're always starting with a better hand. But shorthanded, they're just gonna die if they like take that approach. Right, especially if it's deep. Right. Well, even even deep full ring, uh, I don't think like, uh, I don't think it's bad playing a bunch of hands, but. You know, deep flooring is hard to come by because there's going to be one good player with, you know, 80 big blinds that's going to, like, uh, punish you for right. playing too many hands. That's right. <laughs> there's always a sheriff. So It's probably going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean, in my old age, I've become a lot less active player. I mean, I, I don't... I, I can say, like, I actually... I don't mind playing short. I was playing heads up against a guy the other night into the wee hours of the morning for fucking no good reason. Uh, but I, I, I actually like the breaks to like, you know, I like to sit and sort of watch TV and fold. <laughs> really? I prefer heads up over anything. I'll, I even play like games. I don't even know how to play just to play heads up like PLL or, uh, what was that? Like, uh, just weird games. Right. Uh, I'll play those heads up. I way prefer it. Have you noticed though that in the if you play smaller than say ten twenty, you can't really play heads up because the rake will just murder you. I mean, kind of. Yes, the rake is a complete joke at like five ten heads up, especially like in California where they're they're not doing time. They're right. doing like you know they're doing the dead drop. They're probably dropping yeah, two bucks then, a hand. 
they take two dollars a hand in if you play bigger than five ten. I think five ten is only one dollar a hand. Uh. Uh, no. oh, I guess maybe up in LA too. No, they're tricking but, you. They tricked you because they take one dollar and then they take another one on the river. Now they tricked you. Yeah, that's LA. In San Diego, <laughs> they don't. I don't think they do that. But okay. We never get to the river, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. I mean, the the rake is really bad, but you know, if you want to, if you're playing someone who's just going to be a, a total nit, it's fine. Like they're they're still going get killed like right they're just never going to call you enough so when uh my man tots called in there a second ago by the way anybody else uh who wants to have a question for dga we didn't answer the last guy's question do we? <laughs> i think we answered a lot of it he can call back if we missed part of it five well, five nine online, which, yeah. i don't know i mean online poker I don't have any fucking clue about it either. I haven't played online poker since fucking party poker. I mean, party poker was great. I think the reason yeah. that party poker was great was because there were a lot of people excited to be able to play what seemed like a fun poker game from their house. Uh, there was a lot of limping. There was a lot of multi-way pots. Uh, the games looked and felt fun. And so a recreational player would log on to party poker and they would be like, yeah, this is basically the same as going to the bike, except I don't have to leave my house. Now I think a right. recreational player logs on to any of these things. Cause I still, you know, I still have accounts and the game doesn't resemble at all what they want to do. It's fucking every pot well, goes raise heads up and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's kind of like the last guy that called was an online player. And like, I would be very concerned about the online player. Like just, Especially if I play like six max or full ring, I think heads up your you should always be able to like uh, you know if you're really good continue to beat it like people will try and play you but I don't know about like full ring online is probably just dead. Yeah, well I think that no limit. I mean here's the thing that a lot of people don't know about no limit or may or, and it hasn't been tr the reason they don't know is because it just hasn't been true in a long time is no limits hold them is actually sort of a pretty horrible game if people play it even halfway decent because right. your pre-flop holdings are so important that and the blinds are sort of like i mean it's you just the, the correct way to play it is so tight and a lot, and online has sort of exposed that. You know, on, on, online full ring, people are playing like 14% of their hands and stuff. Um, well, yeah, I mean, online, you have to play tight because you'll get punished right. for not playing tight. Right. Live, you don't have to play tight. Like, I, I do not play tight at all and, and, and win. Um, just live, people just aren't going to punish you. Like, I can raise, like, you know, almost every hand for five hours and not get three that once. Right. You know what I mean? Like, but online they would just be punishing me to death. So yes. yeah, you have to play tight online. So I, I see a, a unknown caller is calling in. I assume it's, uh, I think it's the guy from Australia, uh, Luke. I can't answer your call, Luke, because uh, it won't let me answer your call and keep uh, DGAF's call on at the same time for some reason. Maybe it's because you're calling from Australia. Very, very sorry, Luke. Ah, I wish I could get you on here with us because I know he had some questions. So when the other guy, I, basically back to online poker, it's just, you, you have to have somebody losing money. And I just, I don't know why rich dudes are going to deposit money online. I just, I don't see it happening again. I think that somehow it's like the underground railroad of things rich guys tell each other. They've all decided that the games suck and they're getting cheated. I mean, every rich guy I talk to basically says the same thing. It's rigged. I got cheated. Every single one says that. And so I don't know that you're going to get that that cat back in the bag uh, and by being cheated, they basically mean they're playing against guys who are multi-tabling and using software and doing things that they simply will never do. So they just assume it's cheating or something like that. Right. Um, if online poker uh, does come back, it'll be like more in the tournament arena. I can see lots of rec players playing tournaments. 
but I just can't see them in like six max cash games that go heads up to the flop 100% of the time in a raised pot. I just don't see that. Their money just doesn't last long enough. Well, no, they have to be more protected, kind of like they are in a Bovada, where there's like, you know, anonymous screenings and all that, where it just kind of takes away a lot of the technical aspect. Right. So, so, like, you know, they can't just be, like, solved in one minute and just destroyed. Right. The, the other thing that um, that uh, Tots was talking about was uh, at, at some point, I mean, I'm, this is getting very, like, sci-fi at this point, but at some point, people are going to be able to basically have a heads-up display type thing or instant recall type thing attached to their head or in their retinas or something. What I mean, this is a dumb question, but... <laughs> What do you think that's going to do to poker? Because it's not that far off. Are you talking about for live? Yeah, for live. Like something like Google yeah, well, Glass, where you can record what you're watching. Um, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The sample is too small, too slow. Yeah, it ever will matter. yeah, that makes sense. I like that. I mean, I'm looking for reasons why it'll stick around. I just, I got a little worried about that at one point. It's like, oh, man. I see people, like, sometimes tracking hands in, like, a notebook or something. It's pretty dumb. Like, <laughs> I mean, the sample is just so small. So it's just, you're, yeah. you're in Vegas right now, and you play yep. everywhere, Los Angeles, San Diego, maybe even other places that you want to keep secret. What do you think yeah. the the uh, the sort of state of the games are right now in different areas? Um. Okay. Well, LA is always good. I mean, it depends what games you're talking about. Right. Um. I, well, a lot of people that are probably listening probably play like five five or something. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So, I mean, that's going to be good pretty much anywhere you go, right? Right. Five five two five. I think so. Uh, Vegas in general kind of sucks like the bigger games right but you get people that just go off for like insane numbers that you just don't get in california right so it seems like they suck if you play in vegas you should just be like uh only play when the game is like great and not waste your time when it's just like a bunch of grinders so in, in vegas LA, there's always it, gonna be some bad players in, in in Vegas, do you think that it's worthwhile to like grease floor man for phone calls and things like this? Um, I I don't know if you have to like grease them. There's so much like technology now. In LA, it's like mandatory. Yeah, and even in like you know city where like uh, I tip thirty bucks every time I play. Right, like to different stores. And yeah, it's it's mandatory because they're gonna do something. Everything in Vegas seems by the book, where they don't, like, just start a bigger game. Mm-hmm. You know, they're worried about, like, breaking their smaller game. Just stuff that, in L.A., they don't care about. Right. If you want to play bigger and you tip, they're going to start it right away. Yeah. So, as one of the last of the road gamblers, uh, I don't know if you wanted to... You're, you're, you, You've had times in your life, though, and I mean, this is an interesting conversation. I don't know how much... I don't even know if this is true. Here's a, here is a myth or a legend about you that you have okay. won... That in some casinos, you've won so much money that they threw you out of the casino. Is that actually true? <laughs> no. It isn't true. No. That's a legend about you that I've heard more than once. That's pretty hilarious. No, I, it never I, happened? I, I, really? <laughs> I've gone heaters where I've done, like, really well in some games and, like, uh, but not officially thrown out. Like, maybe, like, the regs or, like, but no way. No. <laughs> well, see, so, uh, we cleared that up. I always, I always like to uh, go off every now and then for, like, a huge number when I'm just, like, uh, completely delirious and playing terrible. So, so <laughs> that should keep everyone happy. Yeah, I had wondered because... When I'm thinking of people that would get thrown out of a casino for winning too much, you're like the absolute last person. I'm like, he he had to be able to massage that somehow. But, I mean, yeah, you go around to these no. tiny, tiny casinos, though, don't you? I mean, People think I'm a losing player, man. So okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> no one, yeah. Do you think yeah, so. being a road gambler is a good idea? Or at some point, would you have said you'd been better off just staying at one casino? Um, 
tough because, like, it depends what your family situation is. Right. Um, it's hard, like, being away from family. That part's really hard. But, like, if you know yourself like I do, and I need to be playing bigger and shorter-handed games, and they're not available where you live. Right. Like, you know, in, in certain places, they won't play overnight shorthanded. Right. In L.A., they kind of will. A commerce, like, someone will always play. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it's just hard. Like, if you're one of those good, like, grinder types, yeah, then you don't need to be traveling. There's no point. Like, you can just play full ring and grind out whatever you want to grind out. Right. Now, but it's, I mean, it's kind of like more of an adventure. I don't look at it, I don't make my decisions like based on like, you know, profitability all the time. I like, oh, I just came to Vegas because I just was like texting my friends to come out. So <laughs> I did. I know the games, the games are going to suck compared to like California this week. You're living the dream, man. You just fucking pull up roots and go wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's the dream. <laughs> Speaking of that, now when when Tots called in, if anybody else wants to call in five five nine eight two three five four eight three, I'm sorry I couldn't answer the last two calls because for some reason it wouldn't let me add you. I would have had to hang up on DGF to talk to you, and then he would have to call back. It's a whole fucking thing. Not worth it. Um, but uh, one of the guys when he called in, you were saying you would not suggest being a professional poker player to anyone. Is that did I hear that correctly? That, yeah, I mean, just 100%. I would not uh, suggest it to anyone, and not because I'm, like, worried about games getting tougher, but it's just, like, I mean, all you have to do is look at how many people have done it as a career that are, like, happy and, like, well off, and there's, like, almost zero Yeah, that have done it for a long time that haven't gone into other areas like you have. Right. You know, where, like, you know, but people just playing... And it's not just, like, variants. Variants can suck. You can make a lot of money, but the game is just so, like, it tortures you. Like, it just, it brings out all the worst qualities in you playing all the time. Like, it turns you just, like, you just all these leaks pop up. Uh, you know, and people that have been doing it for a year or two and been running hot will be like, right. well, that's bullshit. You're just a degen. Uh, but talk to me in five years. That's what I always tell See, people. See if you're still, like, showing up all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and, like, you know? Right. Uh, so, no, I don't recommend it at all. It's just, like, a pretty nasty environment overall. And, like, it's frustrating and it's mind-numbing. Like, if you're smart enough to beat it, the 90% of the stuff you hear at the table you're just going to think is, like, the dumbest shit you've ever heard. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's just, like, it's just pretty mind-numbing and then if it's not mind-numbing that means you have other very smart people at the table and they're making the game shit right so, I don't know. no i yeah. i tend to agree i mean i think that poker is a great hobby um when like right now i sort of have it near hobby level i had it at hobby level in like the late 90s and early 2000s and when it's at hobby level, like an extra five figures a year where you sort of go in when you want, play the games you want, uh, leave when you want, don't sweat uh, huge losing streaks because you got money coming in other places. I think poker is actually like a pretty fucking cool hobby, but... I agree with that. I agree with that. Once you get into the like, you have to be there. You have to get in your hours. Uh, you're always up against it. Like every fucking day, you're just up against it. If you're not like the 1% of people who fucking just run like God for three years, like fucking Juan Lee or something. Uh, right. and of course, even he goes broke. I mean, even, but I mean, for that three year period or four year period when like, you know, if there's a hundred thousand poker players, which of course there is a hundred thousand people trying to be winning poker players, something like mathematically, something like 15 or 20 of them are going to win an ungodly amount of money over say a three year period, four year period. Right. And those right. are all the people who posted two plus two, you know, cause those yeah. people, they can't wait to tell you 
how fucked up you are for running bad for two years straight or something. Because it, they've just right. never been up against it, you know? Yeah, and then the next problem is of those 15, 20 people, uh, probably like 10 to 15 of them are just going to light that money on fire oh, yeah. in some other way. Oh, yeah, playing tournaments mostly. <laughs> tournaments, pit, sports, whatever. Right. Well, they think the money's never going to go away. I mean... The first time yeah. you the first time you fucking went from having nothing to having like trying to figure out places to hire to I mean to hide bricks of hundred dollar <laughs> bills, uh, right. the spearmint rhino just had your name written all over it, you know, because the money's right. never going to go away. As far as you're concerned, I mean, I I was talking to a guy the other day, who was was complaining to me, he was complaining to me that he uh, hadn't made a set, uh, hadn't had a set hold up in like three sessions or something. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> three <laughs> sessions? How fucking hot have you been running your entire life? <laughs> I know. It's, it's pretty crazy when you think about weird stuff like that, like playing live. I'll think about weird stuff sometimes, like just how slow the game is. You see these guys that just flop the set against, like, the overpair, like, the fish is on tilt. Right. And they just win, like, 4K immediately, like, every session. <laughs> and, like, that just goes on. And then you just are like, wow, I just haven't done that forever. And that's what that person's telling you. Yeah. But I just think of weird, I just think of weird stuff, like, I haven't been on either side of Aces versus Kings in forever. <laughs> like, either side of it. Right. I don't know, like, either side of set over set, like, it's just weird. Right. And, like, I remember when I would just, like, always be on one side. Yes. You know? It's just, it's just, it's just so slow and, like, well, yeah. I've, I've thought back, and I've said this before on the show, tell me if you agree with me, if, if I wouldn't have run, like, God, like, maybe in my first couple years, I, I would have never done this. This would have never even occurred to me as a possibility. I think right. that pretty much all professional poker players fucking ran like God at some point, at the very fucking beginning. A 201. Yeah, I, they, well, the ones that became pros went on a heater right before they came pro, one right. way or another, a tournament, yep. big cash flow, whatever. Uh, I didn't, I started playing, I was playing, you know, like the other games before knowing the pros. And then I actually did run that for like my first year and a half or two years. But I just like, and you know, I'm gonna be at the casino anyways. I'm gonna gamble. <laughs> I'm just too competitive to quit. And then I went on a heater. Right. And then I just like, you know, that's all I've been doing since then. A guy from uh, 201 just called in. I I took your call 201. I don't know what happened to you. Call back. Maybe uh, you had your you had the audio very loud in the background. Maybe you thought that whatever. Call back 201. Um, so based on sort of what you know now, because this is, I mean, this is basically what a lot of the listeners want to hear, and I don't know what your thoughts on it are. If you, if somebody had to fucking, if they just had, it was like their thing, they're going to do it no matter what, and you really cared about the person and you didn't want them to fuck up bad, say the person has a decent job where they can save up some money, but, you know, they've been, they've been playing 510 on the weekends for at least a year and you know they're up twenty thousand dollars even though they spent it all and um right. they're going to be a professional poker player come hell or high water uh w when they ask you you know where should i start what should i play how much money should i have saved up what do you think are some realistic numbers i think like well, I mean, obviously, how much what their expenses are. If like if they're single and young and whatever, and like who cares? What's the worst thing that can happen? Quit your job, try and get pro. Like you go broke, who cares? You can just get a job again. Right. You're not gonna hurt anyone. That's fine. But and make sure you're pretty tough, like because it can be miserable. Even if you're very very good at the game, it can be like extremely miserable. <laughs> and like you see people that used to be really good that are just like uh, they're just like battered housewives now like there's like horrible nits right and they used to be really good they just couldn't handle like running bad and then bouncing back right but if you have all that going for you I don't know like I think people should be more aggressive like I, I'm not really like a big bankroll 
management guy. Like, <laughs> if you're good enough, like, who cares? Like, you, it's live poker. You're gonna win. You're gonna win. Right. You don't need. You don't need as much money as people say. I don't think if you're gonna like play shorthanded and you're good at shorthanded. Well, that's a lot of ifs, I guess. You know, but I like that. I like that. I just feel like I don't feel like you need a ton of money because you're gonna go broke. I feel like you need a ton of money because you don't want to. Because here, here, okay, tell me if you agree with this. I know a lot of young poker players, basically because they come in and out of either games I host or just because they see me on the fucking podcast or live at the bike. They want to come talk to me, which I love. I love hanging out with the guys at the casino. I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying a lot of them live a lifestyle that I don't think is worth living just to be able to play poker. They basically like, you know, like we'll talk about Brandon Ool or something. He basically eats fucking ramen every day of his life and, you know, lives lives with a bunch of other poker players and Who is... Who are you talking about? Huh? Who are you talking about? Ool, two hats. <laughs> oh, my God. And it's like... I, I'm I'm signaling I'm only singling him out because he's all already everyone knows him. But this is like dozens and dozens of guys I meet. They live like sort of like a a life. They're giving up so many things in their life just to be able to play poker for a living. Whereas if they had a, a slightly bigger bankroll when they started, they wouldn't have to be like you know like basically like living in a flop house and fucking. Uh, uh, just eating fucking whatever free food they can get at the casino and, uh, you know, basically being like vampires. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just well, like... I mean, I don't even know if I say it. I don't know, but, but, like, is that guy good enough to win a lot of money in poker, live well, poker? Like, I don't know. <laughs> you think so? Like, uh, I don't know. Whatever. He's cool, but... <laughs> uh, to, the, first, the first thing you have to be is really, really good. Oh, that's true. That's like, true. And a lot of these guys are not really, really good at live poker. Like they're, they might be fine. Like you know, in the forums, they can tell you how to play a hand or whatever. Right. Uh, but when it comes down to it, they're just not going to pick up on really basic stuff at the table. That's true. I don't know if that if that's Brandon or not. But uh, oh no, Brandon can't pick up on anything. He's basically autistic. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But you have like you got to make sure you're really like if you're even going to consider it. Right. You better be like sick good. Right. Like not just oh I know which hands to play and like you know like no that's that's not going to get it done. Right. L let me ask you about a specific hand and, and we're not going to talk about strat. I know you're not a strat guy and neither am I. Uh, this is more about a, a, a live poker concept that I may have completely wrong. I'm not, I, I mean, I may have this completely wrong. That's why I'm asking you. DGAF okay. 2 plus 2 legend on the phone. I'm going to get a chance for some free coaching too. Okay. So we played a hand a while back. We were both in the same game, Pot Limit Omaha. You posted it in the forums, and so that's why I don't feel any like, guilt about talking about it um that's fine yeah uh it was a pot limit omaha hand where there uh, you uh, as soon as i start explaining it you'll know it immediately a uh, seat nine was an asian guy who had been drinking a whole bunch of cordon bleu which is sort of a strange yeah, drink for an that. asian guy he had about twelve thousand. he had just felted an armenian gentleman who had about yeah. 5,000 and was tilted out of his gourd. Um, the Armenian gentleman straddled for 100 in a 5 5 10 game. You're next to act yeah. on the button and you have aces in Pot Limit Omaha. You have good aces. You have something like ace, they're good but not great. Good aces. Ace, ace, jack, five with a suit, I'm thinking. Basically, yeah, I don't know exactly what I had, but yeah. Yeah, it was something like that. It was a, it was aces with the suit that worked Broadway and wheel. Um, then there was a bunch of basically newbies to PLO. There was no PLO pros at the table that I can remember, and me who was just whatever. I'm, I'm me. I, 
I do my best. But there was, a, there was a lot of people, like, gambling, it seemed like. There was what? There, uh, people were, like, taking flops and gambling. Uh, no, there yeah. Was a girl in the game that was, uh, she was, like, going off a little bit. Yeah. And you, then, no, it was a know. it was a very good game, in my yeah. opinion, and yeah. it was it was basically a table of amateurs, and a drunk Asian guy with twelve thousand and a tilted Armenian guy with five thousand. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Okay, so now you're first to act after the hundred dollar straddle with with good aces, and. I'm on the button, yeah. Yeah, you're on the button. First act after the straddle on the button with good aces. Yeah. And your question, and you have like 4,300? I don't remember. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I keep track of how much all the fish have. You had 4,300. Um, okay. <laughs> That's weird. I left, I left with like 300. <laughs> so you have 40. Okay. You have about 4,300. So, 4, and your question was, should I raise or should I limp here? Okay. Yeah. Now, strategy wise, I think that the right answer in a vacuum, running it through the fucking Watson computer, boop, 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 <laughs> raise, right? I mean, I think in a vacuum, that probably is the right play because you can't expect to get in a limp re-raise and you can't expect, you can expect people to three bet your raise of that raise just as often because your range is wide open in that spot and it looks like you're fucking, uh, you're isolating the fucking Armenian guy, blah, 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 yeah. just fucking blah, that, blah, blah, that, right? That's not like accounting for like a couple of very important things like no one three betting me right. being number one. Ever, under any circumstances. Not only with like better aces. You know, okay, better, better aces, exactly. When, yeah. But I mean, so, it, I, yeah. I, I'm basically saying in a 5-5-10 five, five, game that instantly goes to 5-5-10-100, five, five, you're not going to get three bet when you make it 400. That's right. what I'm saying. Do you agree? I'm going to get called in one spot. Yes, you're going to get called by the guy who straddled to 100 Literally 100% of the time, even if he has quads in his hand, okay? Now, you might get called by the drunk Asian guy too, but that's just like a bonus. You, 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 don't, you never know. You might get called by, right. the, by, the, by the Asian chick who's going off a little too because she so, I could tell she sort of felt like she wanted to you know, show that she was one of the boys a little bit. She, she wanted to get in there and fucking mix it up a little bit, in my opinion. Right, but mixing it up in like a 5-5-10 five, five, game like calling 40 free or calling 80 free right. or whatever different than calling 400 free. No, she that's never happening. This is this is the yeah. crux of my argument, right? Now, right. If you limp, okay? All you need to have happen is one little thing for it all to go right for you. And that's, that's one what I Huh? What did you say? That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. You just need the most tiniest thing to go right. For you to be in sort of a dream situation where you have one pot size bet left on the flop with with good aces, um, right? With a with a guy, uh, the Armenian guy who will who will get, who's never fucking folding pre flop, okay? No, he's, his range is gonna be, uh, you know, it's everything. It includes his range includes trip deuces. I swear to fucking god. All right. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. Um, one little thing goes right and you can have a very, very good scenario. If two things go right, those two things being the Asian guy raises and Harry, oh, I said his name. Oh God, I fucked up already. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked it up. The, 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 well, the, the, the guy has like a lot of hair on his arm. Yeah, yeah. The, if, the, if, the, if the Asian guy raises... And the Armenian guy flats. Now you get a complete fucking dream situation where you re-raise and you possibly get called in two places, and you end yeah, up playing a thirteen thousand dollar pot with good aces. All right. Yes. 
So that's none of none of this is here, neither here nor there because we're not talking about strat here. And what I'm here's my question. Here's my question to you, and tell me if I'm wrong because I sometimes maybe it's because I've turned into a fucking live poker player. I think about things wrong because I've just been fucking up against it for so long. My thinking uh. here is getting in a five five ten PLO game. Getting with just one or two little things going right, getting in a thirteen thousand dollar pot that will change my entire month, right? That could change my entire month because we're talking about five, five, ten players, right? Right. Is more worth it than making what may or may not be considered the correct button raise against a standard lineup. Am I thinking about this wrong? I mean, I think you're thinking about it pretty correctly in that I just need one thing to go right to have this huge pot where I have, like, a good hand. Yes. And we get a ton of it in pre. Yes. The, the, like, the monthly thing, I don't think that matters at all. I never think of anything like that. Like, oh, this will help my mom through what, uh, you know, that I wouldn't even think about, like. Okay. What my normal like swings are. Right. But m- maybe I should, but I never have. Right. Uh, I just I just think like I'm playing for the home run here because I'm gonna hit a home run like I don't know you know eighty percent of the time. Right. All you know all I need is someone to limp, just one person to limp, uh, or or this guy just to pot like, and that's yeah. gonna happen very often. Yes. So you know it's it's my equity. Uh, you know, when that happens, which happens a ton for all this money, or my equity when I like play an eight hundred dollar pot heading in the flop, and I'm playing PLO, which I suck at. Right. So, like to me, it seems pretty easy to go for that like home run, cram it in, get as much in pre right. as possible. Well, here, I mean, how do I explain this better? In because we both could easily afford that game, but. We both definitely would like to win a five-figure pot in a five-five-ten game, okay? But right. when I think back on my poker life, okay, and maybe the same is true for you. I don't know. I can, and I, this is I, I. I just think maybe I just am. I focus in on the wrong things sometimes. But when I think back on my poker life, and I can think of times where if one fucking little thing would have went right in a much, much bigger games. Like back when I used to play the PLO at Commerce all the time and it was 20, 40, 80 and I'd be sitting 30K deep and all the only thing that fucking had to happen was one little thing. Just, you know, Doc Landau just right. needed to fucking do one little thing. Freddie Deeb just needed to do one little thing. And I literally win an $85,000 pot, right? Um, yeah. And how much that could have changed just a lot of stuff, you know? And oh, that I agree with. That I agree with. I don't, I don't agree with thinking about it during the hand. Like, I think during the hand, you're just trying to make the most, like, plus EV decision. Right. But I agree 100%. Like, there's life-changing pots. Yes. Like, not, not, like, the money. I mean, you know, I, last year, like, every pot I played over 30K, I lost, I think. Like, right. That, those suck, you know? And, like... I wasn't getting it in bad, uh, but you you can recover from or whatever. But if you win them, that's a different story, you know. Right. I I mean, the just the basic concept I'm talking about, and I realize that like everybody that fucking is under the age of thirty and run like God is laughing their ass off at me right now. But I'm just gonna say it because I just try try to be honest. The basic thing I'm trying to the basic concept I'm talking about is live poker is so fucking slow and these crazy scenarios come up so infrequently where if one little thing goes right you change a lot of stuff you might even change the trajectory of your life and then this pot that we're talking about is not one of them but it made me think about this like how many of course like do every big flip you've done everything in live poker, when you see something like this, should you think about it? That's what I'm asking, I guess. I mean, I think you should just think whatever's 
uh, more plus TV. But uh, I'll, I'll give you like an example on a smaller scale that's just like has to do with like confidence and stuff. I was uh, playing out here in Vegas, I don't know, a few months ago. And this guy sat down. You could tell he was like a good pro, whatever. I think he's from Canada or something. And he was on like direct right. And he was like opening too many hands. And I was just min three betting him every single time. Right. And just because I'm not going to fold, I'm not going to call and like have someone behind me punish me. So I'm just going to min three bet. Uh, Every single time we're deep enough, like he can't really do anything about it. Okay. Finally, now he gets like, I think he runs bad against like fish and now like some pro who's on e- on a heater like spazzes out and like gets a perfect run out to bluff this guy i can see this guy's like uh his mojo is like completely gone right and now he opens again and i have two tens and i don't know i guess he opened the like we're playing five ten he opens the 30 and i just make a 50 everyone pulls back to him and like he makes it uh i don't know like 280 or something right and, you know, we're probably, we're not that deep. Like, he's been losing, I don't know, we're maybe, I forgot how deep we are, but I have two tens, and, like, in general, I'm calling here against a normal range. But I just know this guy's, like, frustrated, and I just, like, have some insights into, like, the kind of, kinds of hands he's, like, doing this with. Right. And I just think he's, like, super weak, and he's just, like, had enough. Right. So, I... I uh, min five bet him, right. and like he calls a jack ten with like less than a pot size bet behind. <laughs> he calls a jack ten. It comes jack rag rag two hearts, and he checks to me and like I ship it, and he just wins that pot and everything's back to normal. Right, you know what I mean? Like you can see it in his eyes. Like now he's now he's gonna play good again. If he loses this meaningless pot, which seems meaningless, I don't know, three care whatever. Right, this guy like career might be like going in the garbage you know what i mean like he might lose all confidence right but no he gets, he gets bailed out like calling out of position with jack 10 against 10 right uh with no money behind against like it's just like uh so that is how things change like this guy might be out of here now i might go downstairs and see him like sitting like 10 kg laughing you know what I mean? <laughs> No, that's but exactly I right. Think about stuff like, I think about stuff like that all the time because I'm, like, obsessed with, like, variants and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I don't think in the moment you should just be thinking about what's, like, most plus EV, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, basically, I always think about what's plus EV. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a robotic player than you, probably. I was just thinking just because of that hand and the advice that people gave on 2 plus 2... Uh, I was just thinking like, wow, you know, this is one of those hands where just so little needs to go right for some enormous, amazing thing to happen that never happens in a 5-5-10 PLO game over maybe like a three-month period. And yet you can, you can make one decision where you raise that button that's going to probably guarantee a certain amount of EV, or you can make another decision where you limp that button that may... I don't think you could prove this to me. I still think limping is the best play, but let's say you could mathematically prove it to me that it made 10 cents less. But because of the fact that that situation just doesn't come up enough times in your life, you're better off giving up that 10 cents for this like monster fucking score. I'm probably thinking about this completely wrong. That Well, that, it's like if you think it's 10 cents. Right. Well, then it's like, who gives a shit about 10 cents? Do whatever you want to do. But, right. Like, technically, if you think it's, you know, lower EV, then, then you should be raising. But both you and I, it's hard to, like, it's hard for people to really understand, like, the kind of villains that are in these hands. Right. Because uh, they don't get to play with them. You know what I mean? Like, and they don't know, like, the kind of action that, that you know, they're going to give. Right. Uh, so I think it's just like, okay, it has, you know, if this is happening where I get to uh, limp, re-raise, like, 80% of the time, I don't know, I don't have, like, you know, a uh, pen and paper in front of me, but right. I think you can, like, prove it pretty quickly that it's way more easy to limp. Well, I, yeah, it's, it's when the people, some of the people who I talk to, and maybe even some of the people who post their responses in that thread, 
who play PLO a lot online uh, were saying like, well, the person's, if he raises the button, then, then the, there's the, he's going to get three bet in this spot by this hand. Or if, if he limps the button and then re-raises a, a razor, that oh, yeah. razor's going to be folding this range. I'm just like, no, 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 no. There is no re-raise ever. And there is no fold to three bet, you know? It's like... Well, yeah, that's... That's the big gap with like people who play online is that like they play against much better players, right? And uh, you know people will get stacks in online because what what's a, what's an online stack? It's like such a small percentage of right. someone's role, right? Live, it's like a fucking huge percentage of someone's role. So they're just not they're just, they're not like you know that's why you can play a bunch of hands in live and online because people just will pull way too much, right? Right. So. Uh, yeah, that's the gap between, you know, the online... Like, I, I think there were some good online uh, posters in that thread. Who was in there? Renton was in there? No, yeah, there were some very good posts. And, I mean, just me personally, I started I started thinking in this weird way. That's why I just wanted to ask you about it. Because, like, I'm thinking, like, no, no, this is wrong. This is, like, a dream situation. Like, a couple little things can go right, and you can win a twelve or $13,000 pot, and these little things are going to go right such a high percentage of the time. And there is, and if you raise, you're literally never fucking getting three bet ever. And if a guy raises and you limp re-raise him for 1600, he has a 0% fold to, to limp re-raise range there. So I'm just thinking like, it's not right. They, they, they're not thinking about it right. But then what started creeping into my head was, well, maybe I'm thinking about it wrong because I'm thinking like this is like one of those pots that happens that, that sort of like puts a little warp in the space time continuum for a five, five, 10 game. I mean, you just don't see a lot of five figure pots in a five, five, 10 game. So when like, it's very likely that one is going to come up, maybe I just search them out too much sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're maybe overcompensating. It's just like a huge percentage of the time I'm going to play this huge pot right. with as like a pretty good favorite against his range, right? And a uh, small percentage of the time, it's just going to be two hundred in the middle, and I still like flop the set, right? And like uh, no one thinks I have pocket aces, right? Like, you know, like uh, I, I think I lost the pot. I'm pretty sure, but uh, yeah, I think you did. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> if if you just look at like, I think I think it's pretty clear that you were right that limping is the right play. But if it's just like because you want to win that huge pot, that's just that's different. That's just right. like you know. Yeah. I don't really care about winning huge pots or small right. pots. Oh, I uh, just I love huge pots. <laughs> but I'm used to playing big. <laughs> I'm used to playing big pots in like out of this all the time, no limit. Right, because you you I, yeah, I guess it's a little different for you. I'm I'm usually playing full ring, and so they just don't it, these these situations don't pop up as often, I guess. Yeah, I was playing. I was playing five ten the other night. Right. Um, and like this guy was just like a complete whale that I was playing with short handed. So I was just opening every hand at two hundred. So right. Like, and so we're not really playing five ten anymore. Exactly. Because he's not he's not folding. So it's just like whatever you know whatever blind you want to you want to put out there that would make the open two hundred. And I don't know, and like we, this guy and I were swinging pretty hard, right? So I'm used to playing like really stupid amount of big lines, right? Spots, but I guess that that happens in PLO a decent amount too, especially in the one at bike because we allow the unlimited straddle. So when people get on tilt, they straddle a lot. Yeah, um, I think I, I think I saw you win a very big pot online. I mean, not online. Uh, yeah, it was like YouTube or something. Or maybe it was a live at the bike CLO or something. Yeah, that was that was with our friend. <laughs> with our friend. And I think maybe you did one thing where, like, you check back. That's you know, right. I don't remember the name exactly. You check back, but if this right thing happens on the river, you're going to win a yep. shitload. That's what I did. And Whereas if you bet it on the turn, he's going to fold or whatever. Yeah. I don't remember the exact hand. No. But. Yeah, like, uh, you know, all of the... I, I checked back a hand that most people wouldn't check back. But the thing is, and this is, again, this is my thinking. My thinking is, and I it, it's mathematically sound, I'm sure. But it's also just like my weird thought is, 
against this specific guy, if I check back here and one little thing goes right, I'm going to win 500 big blinds or a thousand big blinds. Like, I just need one little fucking thing to go right. I'm not going to do like, you know, the commentator that night was Oasis Med, who's a very smart guy. He knows a lot of, a lot of shit. And he's like, well, you, you can't check back that hand there. And I'm just like, and I, but then, and maybe like in a fucking vacuum, I don't know. Maybe you can't, but well, in no, my... No, I mean, just because like someone smart says you can't like check back there, that doesn't mean like they're right at all. Yeah. Like, there's so many smart people that don't get all the intricacies of like, playing against certain types of villains. Like, right. You check back there and, like, uh, now he's going to bluff 100% of the time he doesn't hit. Right. He's going to, like, check raise when he does hit. Like, so many great things are going to happen right. where uh, these guys are just thinking, like, so in a vacuum, right. not, like, what, what this guy's uh, ready to do. I mean, tell me if this is something you do, because this is something I do, and, may, and then maybe this is, this is part of it. When I see, and I mean, I assume everyone does this, but I guess they don't. When I see a guy who is willing to gamble sitting a thousand big blinds deep, I completely change my strategy for that table for that guy. Like, of course. That's what I do. I mean, I don't give a fuck about the other people anymore. I still want to win and I'm going to do all my little fucking normal shit. But when there's a guy who's ready to gamble, sitting a thousand or two thousand big blinds deep who will who will get the money in he will get it in i think you have to like warp your strat you have to fucking think outside the box i guess that's what i'm saying yeah of course if i'm in a game like that and there's someone i mean i love that we talked a bunch about pilo because i'm terrible at it right uh if i'm in a little game with someone really deep who will get it in like yeah i mean I'm going to play every pot, like, every time he comes in the pot, I'm coming, I don't care, like, what, right. like, I'm going to, if I'm under the gun, and he's, like, the small blind, I'm going to straddle, like, or to, I'm just going to do stuff where I'm going to be seeing flops with this guy, I don't care, I'm giving away, you know, money to these other guys, but so many times in my life, I've stacked this guy, right? like, you know, this, this you know, not this particular guy, but just the guy <laughs> sitting deep ready right. to gamble. Right. I'm, I'm going to bluff him. I'm going to, like, do different things. And, like, it's going to lead to me and him playing a huge pot when I have, like, a ton of equity. And maybe I'll win and maybe I'll lose. But, right. Yeah, I think he's just tailoring, uh, you know, everyone's sitting there with 100 big blinds and then someone has 1,000 and the person with 1,000 bad, like, right. or ready to get it in. Even if the person's good and ready to get in, you, you need to be, like, uh, making some changes in your uh, strategy, I think. Exactly. I agree. Hey, if anybody wants, I'm sorry that I haven't answered a lot of the calls that have come in. For some reason, my computer is, doesn't want to add certain people. But if, if you want to try again, call in 559-823-5483. We have uh, DGAF on the line first interview ever maybe last uh, hopefully he's having a good time maybe it won't be his last um so i, lo I just love that i'm talking about plo uh, yeah he's a plo expert <laughs> ask him anything about plo i think he even checks his cards two at a time so that's always nice oh yeah <laughs> My favorite PLO players, the ones, this obviously isn't you, but I mean, I love it when the guys sit down and they check their hand two at a time, and then they, they build two hold'em hands in front of them. So they put two of them together, and then they put the other two of them together. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be so good. Um, yeah. Well, we don't, we don't have much time left. Actually, I've run over a little bit. I was going to ask you about one other thing. Since, have you ever played on Live at the Bike? Um, no, I've watched it. I watched, there was like a 10, 20 game recently. Right. Uh, my boy, my boy was on it. So I watched it. Like I was like doing other stuff. I was watching it, but, uh, I think the commentators were Nicole and that guy, the other guy you were talking about. Always. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree that guy's smart. I, I hate to sound like a hater. I just didn't think like he was very in tune with what was going on. Right. Well, but, I think that you know, that's it's, sort of it's true hard for... When you're having a conversation, like, the cards and stacks are hard to see and all that shit. Right. I, I get the feeling that a lot of poker coaches or 
basically like people who are they're obviously smart, sharp people who understand the games, but I think a lot of them basically like uh, they do they don't do individualized thinking. They more just say like, well, this is the standard thing, this is a standard thing, this is a standard thing. And right. in live poker, doing standard things is going to get you broke like a hundred percent. You just will not make enough money to survive. That's my feeling. I feel like you have to be exploiting weaknesses all the time. Well, you have to be doing that. And you just have to be very, very perceptive of like uh, how people are feeling at the moment. Like this guy just—if this guy's winning and happy, he's never bluffing here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can just like fold like huge hands, um, right. just like n- narrowing ranges down. But what were you going to ask about live at the bike? I didn't mean to hate on that guy. I'm sure he no. was really good at poker. But I was just I asking in in general, in general. What do you think of poker training in general? Do you think it's had a big effect or a small effect or no effect? Would you suggest no, people? I, I think it's had a big effect. I think like the you know the card back to card runners and all that stuff was pretty terrible. Right. And like you know like what what's it now? It's run it once. It's like the, the yeah, new one. Like, that's a big one. Uh, and, like, yeah, I think it's pretty horrible and pretty short-sighted. And I've said that, like, in a million threads. Right. Uh, the individual coaching, like, that's not going to catch up. You know, that's that's just, like, what? That's not that big a deal. But there are certain players that, if they got the right coaching, could really screw up your game. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, see, some, I see some young guys sometimes, and I'd be like, I think, like, oh, I could, like, teach this person to win. 200k next year and i would bet on it right <laughs> uh you know and they're pro- and but hopefully they just run bad and quit speaking of that have you noticed and this is something i've noticed a lot of pros are going broke right now a lot of course I this mean, is, but it's like have, a you ma- have the first problem of only like a small percentage of them are good enough to win right and like win over time and then that small percentage is always a bunch of degenerates that right. are going to just fucking torch everything anyway so <laughs> I don't I don't think it's anything new like you go back to Bobby Hopps Bobby Hopps considered what like he's considered a great no limit player right right and he played in the softest games ever the best games ever oh yeah absolutely and, like, I I saw him right like, before he died. I thought he was really good. I saw him right before he died and he broke, like, playing some small game. And I was just like, that's pretty telling of how hard this right. shit is. Like, yeah. Yeah, even when know? Bobby Hoff, like, was coming up. I mean, it was like, I, it, it's sort of sad. And that's one of the reasons why I have tried to diversify as much as I want. I never, I mean, I loved Bobby Hoff. I mean, I played with him so long ago. And he just played. Good, so, right? He played so right. much better than everyone else. I'm not saying that like right. when he died, or even five years before he died, he was still a world class player. But I mean, Bobby Hoff was basically the first person I ever saw three bet ever. You know, right. I, I thought he was good before Bobby uh, Hoff. I don't even think three betting existed before Bobby Hoff. Like he really understood the game and he played well sort of up until the end but then at the end it was just so sad you know he's asking people for money and he can't play in a fucking game bigger than like the two five or something it's like i just i know that that's where oh i hate to i hate to be so down I mean, but like if you just play yeah. poker is there any way you don't end like that is there any fucking way i don't know show me one person <laughs> show me one person that's not like that exactly like, you know, you see Barry Greenside sometimes, like, fuck, man, this shit is tough. Right. And it's not just tough, like, winning money. Winning, like, for certain, some people, like, winning money is just not that hard in live poker. But, right. like, maintaining your sanity and also being a good money manager. Like, right. Being a good money manager and being really good at, like, no limit is those just a conflicting thing. Yes. They're 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 like diametrically diametrically yes, opposed. not care about money, and then ten minutes later care about money. Right, right. And it's even yeah. tougher in PLO. <laughs> yeah. So so what's yeah. so it's what's your pl- what's your plan then, DG? Uh, do you have a plan, or are you just gonna you know you're just gonna grind it till the very end and like 
you know, I'll, just. I'll get up on you, huh? No, I, I would like to get out, but I've been saying that. Um, I've been saying that for a long time. I mean, this, like, my expenses are so high that it just that, and I'm kind of lazy, make it uh, <laughs> hard to get out. I still, I still like to do really well every year. Right. Uh, even though I like. I complain a decent amount or vent a decent amount on uh, two plus two. Right. Uh, compared to like any job I could get, uh, I would do way better playing poker. But no, I, I would want to like start a business, something where I could actually make good money. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I've been talking about it for too long that I feel like a joke for even talking about it. I just need to do it. Well, it's like, yeah, it's basically the same with me. It's like I try to find You've ways to. It. I'm just, I, just, I try to make find ways to make money staying in poker because I've dedicated so much fucking time and energy to this thing and I've survived and I know I can win and it's like why at this point what am I going to fucking do put on a suit and tie it's never going to fucking happen no well you're never going to do it anyway yeah I'm just never going to do it <laughs> yeah and neither am I I'm never going to do that uh, you know it's not like we accidentally got into poker. Right. <laughs> uh, no, but you're doing other things, like smarter things, uh, you know, just like less stressful. Less right. Things that are pretty like, you don't, you're not going to have those bags in your eyes like uh, Barry Greenstein. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't want to go out like that. But I mean, just like you said, I look at every single person from when I started playing every single one not even from the first year maybe the first five years i'm talking like every single person i met from 1998 to 2002 2003 the big pros the ones that are still alive because a lot of them are dead and 99 percent are broke uh, another certain percentage are dead and there's like one percent that are still around and oh they just look like death warmed over it's just so sad <laughs> I mean, there's a couple guys that don't look like that. Uh, Greg Mueller, I think, looks pretty healthy. Yeah, I Mueller's like, done pretty good, but what's up with Mueller? Mueller fucking is always playing craps for like a thousand dollars a point. That motherfucker's got money coming from somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, that could be. I, I've played with him a decent amount, and he is like the exception that uh, he always seems like pretty healthy in all ways. Like, right. You know. But I mean, I don't know, like he binky tournaments and. I don't know. <laughs> or he has, I don't know what the hell his story is. I think he's good, too. I'm not saying he's bad. No, but, Greg's a good player. Uh, I've played with him a decent amount, too. It hasn't sucked the life out of him yet, somehow. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's possible. I definitely think it's possible, and you are probably one of the prime examples of it being possible because, you know, you keep a good attitude and you've kept, like, uh, sort of, like, the right fucking persona and everything else to survive in this fucking gambling world. But I mean, I, I guess, you know, we're just not sugarcoating it, but there's no reason to make it worse than it is. There's a lot of fucking great things about it too. And the truth is, is like the, one of the reasons why you see so many of these guys die at the table is basically because once you're in it, it's fucking hard to get yeah. out of. And it's not hard to get out of because uh, you can't do something else. Cause Bobby from Bobby Hoff to, Fucking, I mean, I'm not going to name names of people who are still alive, but I mean, from from all these guys down the line, they're all smart enough to do something else. But once you're once you're in poker, it seems like oh, I need to get out of poker. But then the next day you get up and you're like, fuck it, I want to fucking go play poker. Well, it's it's the easy cash, right? It's just like the strippers gonna have a hard time to stop dancing and go like uh, work some office job where she's not gonna make shit, right? Like, even though it's going to be much healthier and happier for her. But no. Yeah, I mean... Like, very similar to that. I think after I gave my first lap dance to two hats, I would probably quit stripping. You gave two hats a lap dance? <laughs> no, some strippers have. He, uh, not that you care, but I mean... Two, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strip club in, in Las Vegas called Sapphires. I'm sure you've yeah, known. Yeah, I've heard of it. And heard of it. connected to Sapphires is a great Mexican restaurant called Oro. Oh, really? Yes. So Two Hats goes over to the fucking Mexican restaurant, and then he goes to the strip club, and he has horrible gas. Oh, shit. Yeah, I know. And so it, 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 it 
can you imagine being that stripper? First, you have to give a lap dance to two hats. And then he's been at a fucking Mexican restaurant for an hour before he comes in for the lap dance. And he has horrible yeah. fucking gas. Yeah, I don't envy uh, them at all. Yeah, I would. I could not do that job. It makes Is poker seem like. Right now, am I gonna see him when I go downstairs? You might see him. He'll he'll just be like, "Oh, DJF, I love you." <laughs> uh, okay. So All right, you are time. you ready to go start grinding? I should let you go. I took you twenty minutes over. Yeah, I'm. I'm good. Whatever. All right, man. Have a great night. I'm sorry that I'm gonna miss your dinner, but I did promise you a free dinner in Los Angeles whenever you're here. So you just you know send the text and it's done. Yeah, I need to get up there, and then, uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be up there soon, I'll, I'll uh, see you. And I'll be at the World Series at the end of June, so if you're still there at the end of June, Kim will be there, you know, maybe we go hang out. All right, sounds good. All right, thanks a lot for coming on the show, hope it wasn't too bad. All right, man, no problem. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. There he was. The man... The myth, the legend, DGAF. I'm really sorry, Luca Mac. I know you were calling from fucking Australia, but uh, it wouldn't let me add you. Very sorry. I mean, if you want to call in right now, you can. I mean, normally I don't go this far over, but because I fucked up and couldn't take your call, there was another guy from 201. There was another guy from 778. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't take your calls. It wouldn't let, wouldn't, so if you want to call in right now, feel free. If not, you know, we're going to call it a night here. Uh, I'm cooking some chicken high heat method. My wife is cooking the chicken high heat method, but it's very good. Ro roasted chicken is just so fucking good with root vegetables. So if nobody wants to call in, I'm going to go have some roasted chicken with root vegetables. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. And uh, we will see you all next week.